Alright, so our objective today is that we will learn about natural selection versus selective breeding and sexual versus asexual reproduction blushing. Um, so we're basically looking at two different things. We are, um, but they're very, fairly short and fairly straightforward. So we do both of them today. Um, we'll be going through and looking at natural selection versus selective breeding first, blushing. The essential question, so by the end of this period, you should be able to answer what are the differences and similarities between natural selection and selective breeding. So, we're doing Cornell notes, but if you look, you are basically comparing and, uh, comparing and contrasting two different things, right? So, thinking about how to take your notes. If you're comparing and contrasting two different things, what are some ways that you could do that a little easier? Do a T-chart. T-chart or Venn oh, diagram. Okay. So even though we're doing Cornell notes, it does not necessarily have to look like an outline, basically, with bullets. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. If you want it that way, that's okay. But you also need to make sure that when you're looking and doing Cornell notes, it doesn't necessarily have to be bullets. It doesn't have to be an outline. It can be a T-chart. It can be a Venn diagram. Okay. It could be another another type of concept map. So it could be anything that you're putting into your notes section. Cornell notes is you doing questions summary at the end. Okay. So please do not feel like you have to do it in in like a bullet style notes. You can do it in a T-chart if you want. Actually, that's probably the way I would do it. I would do a T-chart. Or if you want to do corn. Uh, a Venn diagram, you could do a Venn diagram, okay? So just because I call it Cornell notes does not mean that you can't do it in a different format uh, in the note section of, of the notes, all right? So what we're looking at today is we're looking at natural selection versus selective breeding, okay? We're looking at what they are and what are some differences and similarities between them. So, looking first at what they are. Natural selection is basically a process by which organisms are most suited, most suited or better adapted to their environment, therefore they survive and they reproduce. That's a lot to write. Correct? Natural selection basically means the better adapted live and reproduce. That's what it is. Okay? So the better adapted to the environment are the ones, bless you, that are going to survive, and they're the ones that are going to reproduce. They're going to pass on their genes. And what basically uh, makes that happen is the environment. So specifically, natural selection is the environment choosing who lives, who dies, and if they live, they can reproduce. So in natural selection, what allows a population to grow and organisms to survive is the environment. They're adapted to the environment, therefore they can live. So when we, were think, when we did the little activity last week with the M&Ms and the candy corn, what colors were better adapted to the candy corn environment? Yellow and orange. Yellow and orange. Okay. So, if I ended up with, let's say, 24 yellows left after the activity, which I can't really remember the numbers, but let's say 24. And those were organisms, that means those 24 survived, because y'all didn't pick them. And that means that they were able to reproduce, correct? So, let's say they go through, and we're going to say asexual reproduction just because they split in half. Let's say those 24 go and were able to reproduce, so now instead of 24 yellows, now I have 48 yellows in there, right? And I keep doing that over and over again. Well, if the yellows continue to survive over and over again, then I'm going to have a very high population of yellows, correct? That's natural selection. The environment selected the yellows to live. Now, not necessarily to say, okay, I want the yellows to live, but just because they are better adapted to the candy corn colors, they're able to survive and they're able to reproduce. 
That's what natural selection is. Okay? Now, selective breeding, on the other hand, is a human or person selecting or choosing a gene or a characteristic that they want. So in selective breeding, the human chooses the characteristic they want to pass on. So if I want a very tall rose bush that gives a lot of roses, then I'm going to make sure that the plants that pollinate each other are my tallest rose bushes and the ones that give the most roses. I'm selecting that. I want tall rose bushes and I want a lot of roses. So I choose that characteristic. I make sure that the roses that pollinate each other are the ones that I want. So in selective breeding, a person chooses a specific characteristic. Okay? So natural selection, the environment chooses, basically. And in selective breeding, a human chooses. Now, just because natural selection occurs in nature and nature chooses it, humans actually play a part in that. So we're going to look at an example. So we're going to look at an example that's called industrial melanism and it basically happened uh, after the industrial revolution. Okay, and you've already started studying the industrial revolution in social studies, right? Okay, so raise your hand, who can tell me what happened during the industrial revolution? Okay. I'm sorry? Things, what type of things? Okay, technology industry, right? So technology industry, all that started uh, kind of rising up, correct? Now, you're studying the Industrial Revolution, specifically what part of the world is the, did the Industrial Revolution begin? Sydney. North where? Specifics. Oh, no. America. Like in, like, talking. Oh, what's the question again? Where did the Industrial Revolution begin? Mm, oh, it began in England. England. Very good. So, basically, all these factors started rising up in England, correct? Now, before the Industrial Revolution, the environment of England was very wooded. There's a lot of trees. Okay, and those trees had uh, these lichens on them. Lichens are like, they're almost like fungus, but they're a different type of, <coughs> of uh, ornament. Anyway, so these lichens are like these grayish, greenish, you know, organisms. And then that made the bark of the trees light in color. Okay, well in England there's these two types of moths. There were these kind of grayish light moths and these dark moths. Before the Industrial Revolution, all the trees were covered in these lichens, so they were kind of light in color. Well, the, who do you think, or which population do you think was the highest? The light color moths or the dark color moths? Light. The light color moths. They're light color moths because they were able to hide and camouflage. So the birds didn't catch them as much. The dark color moths stood out a lot, so the dark color moths got caught a lot more, so the population was up. So when the Industrial Revolution started, and you have all these factories basically giving off a bunch of pollution, that pollution goes up in the air, the lichens started dying off, plus all the, the soot and stuff started getting like uh, kind of plaked on the, on the trees. The trees darkened. So after the Industrial Revolution, when the trees darkened, do you think those light colored moths still were, were still able to hide as well? No. Now the light colored moths stood out and the dark colored moths were able to hide. So the population size for the moths actually changed. So before the Industrial Revolution, it was a high light color and a low dark color. After the Industrial Revolution, you had a high dark color and a low light color. And the reason for it is because of something called industrial melanism, which is the darkening of, um, of environment and, and uh, things. So 
if you look at this, this is what it was what it was before the Industrial Revolution. So this is the bark. There's what the light colored mom, there's a the dark colored moss. Obviously, these are gonna get picked out a lot easier than these, right? So before the Industrial Revolution, there's very few of these and a lot of these. Then, after the Industrial Revolution, you had something that looked like this. So, your bark darkened, therefore now these were able to camouflage and these were not. So, the population numbers switched because of the Industrial Revolution. So, this is an example of selected, I'm sorry, of natural selection. The environment before the Industrial Revolution, the environment selected, or specifically, the light moths were better adapted, therefore these survive more, these um, reproduce more. Okay? After the Industrial Revolution, which was caused by us, but it's still the environment. Now the environment is better adapted, or these are better adapted to the environment. So the dark ones increase and the light ones decrease. So this is an example of natural selection. Nature, the environment, is selecting which one increases and which one decreases. Even though it was basically our fault, it's human's fault because of the Industrial Revolution, but it's still natural selection because nature selects one over the other. Any questions on what natural selection is? Okay. So in natural selection, what you're looking at is the environment selects which one survives, which one dies. So specifically, in summary, natural selection, the environment influences who survives, who doesn't. Okay? Now, Natural selection occurs over thousands of years. The first person who come up with natural selection and evolution was Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin basically came in and said, the strong survive, the weak die. And when I say strong and weak, it does not mean strength-wise. It basically means the genes. The stronger genes are the ones that get passed on, the weaker genes are the ones that do not. And the reason for it is because stronger genes basically means the most adapted genes. Okay? At that moment in time, because it can change just like the moths. But at that moment in time, whatever is most adapted to that environment, those are the strong genes, which, which means they're going to be uh, passed on. So he came up with the idea of evolution and said, if an organism is better adapted, they're going to pass on their genes. Eventually, the genes that are not very well adapted disappear. The genes that are very well adapted end up changing a species over a very, very long time. Like thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Okay? So, he did this by looking at finches. So, if you look at this picture, it shows Basically, um, these different birds, and these birds on the outside came from this middle bird in the middle. And he did this by looking at uh, and studying finches or birds on the Galapagos Islands. Basically, he, came, he went to the Galapagos Islands, and it's just basically a bunch of little bitty islands right here off of uh, South America. And he came up with the theory of evolution. He said that by looking at these different birds, he realized that all of these birds came from one bird, one specific bird. Okay, they all started off as one, as one type. But because some of these birds had to move to different islands, and the different islands had different food sources, because some of these birds had to compete within the same island, the birds eventually adapted and evolved to what they are today. So now some of the birds eat only insects. Some of the birds eat um, type of nuts. Some of the birds have to 
burrow to find their food. Some of the birds might eat honey. So because they had to compete or they had to or they moved, their beaks over time changed to what they are now. Now they're all different species, but they all came from one. So they have changed so much that now if they try to mate, they don't because they're a different species. But they all came from one because of the fact that they had to adapt to the environment. So that means that, let's say I had two islands. So the island over here on this left side had a lot of um, hardwoods, which basically means that they give nuts and, and the birds eat there. Well, the ones that can eat there are the ones that have very hard beaks that can break through the nuts, right? Well. If they're not, they don't have hard beaks and they can't break through that, are they going to be able to eat? So they're going to die, right? And this other um, island, you don't have any nuts, but you have a lot of insects. Well, a bird that has a very thick beak, can they, are they able to like go into little holes and get those insects out of there? No, so they're not going to be able to survive. The ones that have the thinner beaks are going to be able to survive. So what Darwin said is that over time, thousands and thousands of years, natural selection occurred, therefore leading to evolution. So very important that you understand, natural selection occurs because of the environment, and it occurs over a very, very long time. And it basically ends up in evolution of a species. How do they okay. like change? Because, okay, so let's say these birds over here had that strong beak. They're the ones that are going to um, reproduce, right? They had a stronger beak. Because they all started with the same beak. But some of them had a little stronger beak than others, right? Some of them might have had it a little longer than others. You know that because we're all human, right? But are we all the same? Some of us are taller, some of us are short, right? So let's say we go outside and we have to live out in the area. And the only food out there is food that is pretty high up. So us short people, either we're going to have to learn how to climb, or we're going to die, correct? So eventually, with the short genes, listen, eventually with the short genes kind of run out. And who would survive? The taller ones, right? So eventually most of the humans would end up really tall and they're really very, very short people. That's how you end up changing. It's because over time, the genes that are better adapted are the ones that are getting passed on over and over again. Now they don't change from one to the next. They change over a long period of time. Evolution takes thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Okay? So any question over evolution or natural selection? We're going to get to that when we get to human body because it's a little bit different. What you need to realize is that genes aren't just, you have a tall gene, you're going to be tall, doesn't matter. Your diet has something to do with it, your amount of exercise has something to do with it. So other things play a role into it, but right now if we just look at just genes overall, then the likelihood of you being tall is very, very small whenever your parents are short. But because the environment also plays a role into it, then that, that kind of changes things. Yeah. All right, so now to selective breeding. In selective breeding, humans influence what occurs to the gene. So in natural selection, it was what? The environment. The environment. Very good. In natural selection, is the environment. In selective breeding, it's humans. We choose what we want. Okay? We choose if we want chickens that make, that basically uh, can lay two, three, four eggs a, uh, a day. We choose chickens that give us large eggs or brown eggs. Okay? We choose cows that give us a lot of milk. We choose cows that are really, really big so we can have more hamburgers. 
out of one cow. All right? So we choose the things that we want. Plants, same thing. So when it comes to selective breeding, we choose the characteristics we're looking for, and that's what we breed and end up getting. So if we look at dogs, everybody in here knows that there's like a whole bunch of different breeds of dogs, right? So we choose what we want to look for. People that are like dog breeders, they basically look for a trait. Like for example, people that take their dogs to like the dog shows and stuff, they look for dogs that have really, really shiny coats because that's one of the categories or whatever, you know, their coat. So they look for the ones that have the very shiny coats, very long coats, things like that. So they look for dogs with those characteristics and those are the dogs they mate because they want shiny, dark coats, all right? Um, they also breed for purity. Like for example, if you go and you buy a dog and it's a purebred dog, meaning they have papers that say they're purebred, and if that paper is like fake, you can go to jail for that because you're, you're basically falsifying information. So they have papers, these dogs have papers that say they're pure, meaning that they're not, there has, there's nothing in their blood that is not that specific dog. So like let's say you want a purebred German Shepherd. And you go buy them. It's gonna, they're going to be expensive. They're, they're going to have to have that paper that says they're purebred. That meant that their parents, their great-grandparents, their great-great-great-great-great-great-great-parents, every, basically as much as they can, was just pure German Shepherds. There's nothing else in it. All right? That's the like the breed. Now, it's good because we get what we want, right? It's bad because when you have something like that and you are making a dog purebred, there's nothing else in there, well, you're having to cross and breed brother sisters, right? You have to. I mean, you have to, in order to know for, for sure that the parents were the same exact thing, would you have to do that? Now think about it. Just think of, think of, think of us. All right, so, we have specific diseases and mutations and things like that, right? Yeah. When you go to the doctor, uh, your parents probably do this for you right now, but eventually they're going to say, oh, hey, you know, what's your family history? Do you have diabetes in your family? Do you have this in your family? So on, correct? Yeah. They ask you, they ask questions like that. So think about it. Let's say that goes back to dogs. Dogs have diseases. They have heart problems, some, some have heart problems, some have uh, different diseases, they can get cancers, they can get different diseases, okay? They're an organism. So think, if you are crossing same family dogs over and over again, if they have a mutation for cancer, aren't you passing that on every single time? Yeah. So eventually, they're going to get it. Same thing with, with heart problems. If one of them has a heart problem and you keep crossing them over and over and over again, you're passing and increasing your likelihood of the dog to ha of a dog having those problems. So with selective breeding, yes, you get what you want, but then sometimes you get what you really don't want. And the reason for it is because since they're pure, you're having to pass on those same genes over and over and over again. Eventually, I mean, all DNA has some type of problem with it. I mean, because we're nothing's perfect. We're not perfect. Animals aren't perfect. They're going to have some type of mutation or something wrong that you're going to eventually pass on, and you're eventually going to see in the lineage. So everybody has something wrong with them? Of course. No one's perfect. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were perfect? I'm going to burst that bubble right now. No, I, I <laughs> no? <laughs> I'm bursting the bubble. If any of you thought you're perfect, burst, 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 okay? No one's perfect. Your DNA is not perfect. It has issues. But like, sickness, like everybody has a sickness. That's not talking about. Probably. You have something. There's something wrong in your DNA. Okay, Cindy, listen. Last year, shh, shh. Okay, last year you should have studied DNA, right? Okay, hopefully they talk to you. Pardon this interruption. 
But this time we come to the end of our four hour session. And I told you that DNA is this long, long, long strand of all these different codes and all these all different proteins. And they have to be paired up exactly the way they should in order for our things to work correctly. Think about it. If you had any absence to it today, you can put those in front of those test booklets and deliver those to Mr. Meyer. He'll take care of being those Think. retested later this week. How is it, why would it be possible so for millions and millions sure of codes to, get those test to be divided to and copied, divided and copied, divided and copied, divided and copied, divided and copied, millions of copies of copies of copies of copies and they're not being there? To lunch. Does it make sense? I mean, think about it. So, no carriers may go to lunch, and then we'll go to fifth and sixth period as regular. Thank you. Uh, this, these DNA strands to be copied and copied in millions and millions and millions and millions of times. Over and over again. And there not be one error, at least, there's more, at least one error, at least one time. There's almost a 0% chance for that not to happen, right? Because it's so long. There's so much information. Now, what's good is that our body is somehow very, very intelligent and complex and is able to bypass a lot of those errors and ignore the errors. Problem comes in is sometimes it doesn't or it can. And that's where we end up with the different mutations, different diseases. But everybody's DNA is messed up in one way or another, at one time or another, because the likelihood of that not happening is crazy. There's millions and millions of codes, and it's dividing millions and millions of times. So, no worries. <laughs> All right, so if you look right here, it's just kind of a picture that shows. Um, how basically every single dog that we have right now came from a wolf. Some of them look like them, some of them do not, but their ancestor was a wolf. And this is evolution. And it's happened once again. Thousands and thousands, thousands of years. So evolution occurs over a very, very, very long time. Now, we already said that, right? With selective breeding, this change can also take a very long time. It just does not take as long as natural selection does. And the reason for it is because we make it happen faster. Okay? We cross it much more than nature would. So, uh, other examples of uh, selective breeding, livestock, okay, people are going to want bigger cows, okay, bigger beef, more hamburgers. <laughs> I mean... Uh, same thing with uh, vegetables, fruit. If you look at this, we know what corn looks like, right? Everybody knows that that's corn. But corn started like that. This is what corn used to look like. Oh, really? Yes. Now, how did it evolve from here to here? It's because um, a little bit natural, but much more selective. In which crossing, obviously, bigger husk of corn, and crossing bigger husk of corn, and crossing bigger husk of corn, eventually leads to what we have now. Okay? So once again, this is evolution. So be it selective breeding or natural selection will eventually evolve a species, the difference is that in natural selection it takes a lot, it both take a long time, but natural selection takes longer than selective breeding. Apple, same thing. So our essential question was, what are the differences and similarities between natural selection and selective breeding? So what are some similarities between both of them? What do they both do? Or have in common. They both, they both change. They both change. Very good. Okay? They both change. You have a change in natural selection, you have a change in selective breeding. So they both change. Now what's the difference in that change? Sydney. For um, natural is when the environment chooses like whoever is most adapted, those are who lives and not to like the disease and stuff. But then for like selective, you like Humans choose like whatever it is that they want, that's why it's bad, it's so and then they like reproduce them in the natural state. Okay, very good. Alright, so similarity, they both change, right? Difference is in natural selection.
selection, the environment's basically choosing, and selective reading is a human choosing. Right? What else is different between the change of one or the other one? Percy, what do you think? Because remember, they both lead into evolution, they both lead into change, but what was another difference other than nature selects it, human selects it? What about time difference? Okay, which one takes longer than the other one? <coughs> You're saying selective takes longer or takes shorter? What do we control? Selective. Which one do we control? Selective or natural? Selective. So do you think that we would take longer or a shorter time? Short time, very good. Okay, so in selective breeding, even though it takes time, it's still a long time. It's not, you know, I can't do it from now until the end of the year. Okay, it still takes years. But obviously it takes less time to go through selective breeding than through natural selection. Natural selection takes thousands and thousands of years. Okay, we have a whole bunch of dogs and we haven't been here in of years. So, ours is faster. Okay, alright, so... Any questions over natural selection and selective breeding? Yes. Can you like do that to like humans like you would have been wearing? Uh, they do, they tr they've tried in the fact that they're trying not specifically to change a human, but to try and stop some of those errors from happening. Uh, they have tried to go in and maybe look at mutations and not, uh, not make specific things. Like for example, uh, people that have a high risk of, let's say, heart disease or things like that, um, they pay a lot of money to analyze the percentage of eggs that they might have with the disease or sperm. And they might go in and actually have help to try and make sure, or you're never going to be 100% sure, but to minimize the chance of them having a baby with specific disease. But it's hard. Because the only way you're going to do that is if they fertilize, and then after they fertilize, you get a, a good mass, and then you test it. Then you get into the, the questions of, okay, well, it's already fertilized, so is it a baby? Is it not a baby? Is it okay that I throw this out or not? So you have a lot of issues with stuff like that. So it's hard to do with humans just because you would not be able to know until the egg is fertilized, and, uh, and until that occur, but if that occurs, then you get to the issue of some people consider a fertilized egg a baby already, and some people do not. So you get into, to, not not necessarily abortion, but because it's not in the woman yet, but in the point of, okay, this is already a baby, and you're telling me to throw it out if you don't want it. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's a lot of issues that go along with that. And like, in the movie, it, um, what's it called? That's the movie. Uh, I Oh yeah, Sister Skipper, they like made her, is that like real? Is that like real life? Because like... They made her as in, they looked for a, they looked for an egg and that had, they could still go in and look at DNA and things like that. So they made her in the sense that they made sure that the, the baby was going to have the same type of blood and things like that. So they could, they, they could use some of her tissues to trans uh, to transfer him to the sister. Yeah. Yes, they can do that. But like I said, to the point of, oh well I want my baby to have blue eyes, blonde hair, this and then this and this and this, that's going to the little extreme. It's something that we could do probably, but then you get into ethical issues of so you're telling me that if this first try doesn't doesn't happen, you're just gonna throw away the baby. I mean, then you get into ethical issues. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to do